up in them days myself. We used to swap uh, two barrels for a gallon of whiskey. And that's what I'd do. I'd swap two empty barrels for a gallon of whiskey, and I kept the whiskey in the cab all the time. I was up then about 17 years old. And when a couple got ready to get married there, you know, they'd, uh, he'd have them come down and jump the broom handle. Mm -hmm. and that's the way that he married them. And he got a big kick out of that. All kinds, all kinds of problems, especially with your labor. We'd go down in the quarters looking for a, a negro. He'd ask him if he'd seen old Bill or Tom. He said, no, I wouldn't rightfully know where he is. He's either going up the road, down the road, or off a piece. That's the only three places a nigger's ever been, was up the road, <laughs> down the road, or off a piece. You got to pay to keep from killing a man. You got to pay to keep from cutting him. And you got to pay for him not cutting you. We lost last year, read it, uh, about 5,000 faces at one time. The big rooster fighters come out of New Orleans, done them barbecuing and all, and just throwed the, the charcoal over in the grass, you know, and they just, just set it to fire. When you have a fire, it gets you in your timber in the middle of the year, that way you, you have to cut it. But now in the wintertime, it don't hurt it too bad. We got to scrape off, you know, and all, and it's just dormant, you know. But like it is now, if you get a fire, it just ruins the timber. It has to be cut. It's the greatest hazard we got to fall. The name of this film is Spirits of the Pines. It's about pine trees and it's about turpentine, but it's really about people. It's about the people who lived in these woods, in camps, and who made turpentine from these trees. Turpentine, or naval stores, has been a way of life in Georgia since colonial days. Unfortunately, many Georgians don't know very much about it. And dramatic changes in recent years have caused many of the old ways to become lost. This film was made in an attempt to preserve that heritage before it disappears entirely. What you will see and hear is both raw and real. The people who lived and worked in the isolation of turpentine camps developed a unique subculture of Southern society. It was a rough life, and it was reflected in their games, their language, and their attitudes toward each other. We've attempted in this film to let them tell their own story against the backdrop of the work itself. The name Naval Stores comes from the early days when pitch and tar from pine trees was used to caulk wooden sailing ships and to preserve their riggings. Empires were built with ships like these and the British were quick to see their North American colonies as a cheap, reliable source for naval stores. The new industry grew very slowly until the practice of distilling raw gum into turpentine and rosin became practical in the 1830s. By 1850, naval stores had become the South's third largest export behind cotton and tobacco. Before the boom, Naval Stores production was a small farm sideline, but the rich market began to attract the big planters, and work in the woods was transferred to slaves. The Civil War ended the early Naval Stores boom period, and production returned to poor farmers. Loan centers called factorage houses were set up to loan a producer enough money to finance his entire operation. The Savannah Cotton and Naval Stores Exchange set the price for Naval Stores each day. Selling at the right time could make or break a producer for an entire season. But a federal antitrust suit ended the system in the late 1940s. Turpentine Camp. It's called Five Mile Camp. It's five miles from Homerville, Georgia, in Clinch County. Turpentine camps are very definitely a part of Southern history. They've been a neglected part. You don't run into them in textbooks. But the naval stores industry is the oldest industry in the United States. And camps like these have existed in the South since late 1800s. They've changed very little in all this time in some ways. 50 years ago, they were extremely isolated. No paved roads around them, no way in and out except horse and buggy, wagon. You now see cars parked in front of them, which weren't there before.
What size operation do you have here, Mr. Powell? About eight crops. This is uh, really a fairly large operation today, but uh, how large an operation have you ever been on? Dad has been on a lot bigger ones than I have. He could tell you probably about the bigger operations. Oh, I've been on uh, an operation where they have 70 crops in Louisiana. That was in Louisiana. We have 70 crop boxes. Well, how long have you been in turpentine, Mr. Brown? All, all my life. I was born on a turpentine place. Uh, they saw some of the timber behind the turpentine, you know, and naturally I went to work for Mr. Ernest there uh, in the turpentine, working in the commissary, taking the mail to the train and picking up the mail, bringing it back to the post office, and I just started in there. Just, How old were you when you started doing some of those Oh, things? just a, I don't know exactly, just a kid, just, mm -hmm. just a young, just a young kid. How did you decide that you wanted to be in turpentine instead of well, saw by, milling? Well, by working there with Mr. Ernest, and I just like the idea of riding a horse. Well, you rode the woods on a horse, you know, and I just like the idea of riding a horse. And I always said I wanted to be a woodsman. The job of the woodsman or woods rider is to oversee the work in the woods to make sure it is done properly. The job has changed little over the years, although the Powell's woods rider, Joe Williams, does use a truck instead of a horse. The sequence of work in the woods goes like this. In early spring, the timber is prepared for the summer gum season. It is called hanging timber or hanging virgin. A metal cup and gutter is attached to the tree with a double-headed nail, which makes removal easier. Each worker calls his special sound to the tally man who keeps track of the work in progress. In the early days, preparation took a great deal more work and skill. Instead of cups and gutters, boxes were cut into the tree itself with an ax. In 1904, Dr. Charles Hurdy introduced cups made out of clay. These Hurdy cups were used through the 1930s. They improved the quality of gum and helped greatly in conserving timber. The wound or streak on the face of the tree is made with a tool called a bark hack, which removes only the bark of the tree down to the cambium layer. As the weather warms, the sap rises and flows from the wound into the cup. Throughout the summer months, each tree must be visited by a worker periodically to refresh the streak. Current practice is to spray a 6% solution of sulfuric acid on the streak to keep the sap running longer so that the tree only has to be chipped once every two weeks instead of every week. As the face moves higher and higher up the tree, chipping gives way to pulling with a longer handle tool. Chipping is mostly lonely, solitary work. It requires practice to do it well. Gathering the gum is the work of dip crews. The gum is removed from the cup into wooden buckets with a tool called a dip iron. The buckets are emptied into barrels, which are taken to the still for processing. Because of the rough scrub in the area, the Powell will still use mules to haul the gum gathered by the dip crews. At the end of the season, the crusted gum or scrape is removed from the face, and it too is sent for processing. Many producers still practice raking pine straw away from the base of trees in the fall to prevent fire. Well, I like it because there's a lot of work in it. I just like the work. I like the... I've been in term time for about 20 years, and I just look like I just stays in it. It's a steady job, and you can work it like you want to. You don't have to be in no cramp, nobody to make you work. You know, you can work as many hours as you want. It's hard work in it, and then it's pleasure in it. And it's not hard to just say if you know how to do it. It's a sliding hand in any work that you do, you know. You done done it so long, you know how it's done. I've been with 
my boss here about 10 years. Been with him, working with him. Started off just driving truck. I wasn't a woodsman the first starting off. I started off just driving the truck. And I, as far as I know, we get along good, me and the boss, man. And we have our little problems, you know. Something ain't right, they'll come to me and tell me about it. I go and try to straighten it. They let me handle the men's. I takes care of all the preparation of being with the men's right now. And I give them the money whenever we get paid off. They give me the money and I give it to them. And we go to town, you know, and spend a little, come back home, go back to town again sometime, just frolicking around. And we have a good little camp, you know, as far as I know. Good now. Do it done. You're stealing for the man, eh? Yeah. I got the man. You're going to get a cut out of it. Yeah. Go on, Chessie, boy. Get him five cents. Back in the olden days when I was a boy, they'd have what the, the labor would have, what you call skin game. And they'd come in uh, and say they paid off every two weeks. You could see uh, colored people come from all uh, de other different camps and they'd gang up at one place, you know. And they'd gamble the whole weekend. And then they'd get in a fight maybe over a dime or 15 cents or a quarter or something like that. And then wind up, they, they could beat two or three killings over the weekend. So Monday morning was a burying day and uh, you tried them on the commissary gallery. And if he was a good colored fellow, you didn't do much to him. If he wasn't any good, you run him off. The biggest thing we had to watch is a, is a whiskey, too, coming in, you know. Now, last week, we had to put one family out of here. I caught him with 22 gallons of white lightning. He had him a jukebox down there, and he's caught him too much confusion. He's juking all night, not working the next day, you know. We got it quieted down now. We've had several to get killed here, several. Over the last 12 years, we've had around 8 or 10 to get killed. The TV station called it the OK Corral. <laughs> For the NAACP, we handled it ourselves, which was a lot better. We went out and got it stopped, you know, and then tried to keep him out. See, if I get one in jail, I got to pay him out. You understand? And then if I can keep him out of jail, I save money, you know. We had one down here about two weeks ago. And they couldn't handle him down there, and I, so I went down there, and he bowed up at me, you know, and I got a 22 pistol, I can show it to you, and a six-inch barrel, I just hit him over the head with that. And he just, uh, some way, he got clean over the car. We made a good boy out of him. He went to work the next morning. <laughs> I'm not knocking him, understand? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just telling you the, the truth, and, uh, as I know him. But oh, one of them told me I was getting after him, you know, about the, he wanting to borrow some money. I said, well, I said, Joe, why in the world don't you save your money? You could have money. He said, Bo, let me tell you one thing. He said, if you could be a nigger one Saturday night, you'd never be a white man no more. <laughs> so all that thing, your woodwork's not all of it. You got to be a psychologist and everything else to, to operate turpentine. Uh-oh, I see that turn that one. Turn it. <laughs> oh, be good, sir. You missed <laughs> up. Hey, hey move. Bet. I'm gonna probably catch you there. Gotta keep your eyes yes, on you, Sam. You can do it. I got you. Y'all don't know this how to play Georgia Skin. This Georgia Skin we playing, huh? I know it, but you got to play right. Turpentine camps were very paternalistic places. Dependency extended to almost everything food, clothing, shelter, health care, even justice. Although only a few exist today, in the old days, every camp had a commissary where workers could get provisions on credit. Debts were deducted each payday, and many workers stayed tied to the producer by debt almost as effectively as during slavery. Like plantation slavery, the naval stores industry was a self-sufficient, closed, stratified society. This system was passed from father to son, generation to generation. White producers passed it on to their sons, and black workers passed it on to theirs. Well, my father, he was a turpentiner. He, that's where I was born at on a turpentine job. Mm -hmm. My father, he worked turpentine 
till I had him to stop. He worked, he was about 71 years old. And I stopped and put him on his pension and Social Security. And he had to quit the certain time, but he worked it back in the, when the pressure was on, hard times. He said he worked for 35 cents a barrel. I've never done that, but he has, he said. With seven of us boys and three girls. To start with, when I was about nine years old, we started dipping turpentine. And we'd come in in the afternoon, and uh, you'd grab a sweet potato. You didn't have but two pair of overalls, and one went to school and one went to the dip wood, you know. And we had to dip that barrel of gum if it was 8 o'clock that night or after any time after. You didn't come back till you dipped the gum, and then you had supper, you know. So we we done that, and then uh, when I was 13 years old, I started driving a mule wagon bunching out gum, and uh, they was paying us 10 cents, tip, paying me 10 cents a barrel to start with, and then that was too much, and they cut it down to, I believe it was seven. And then it went on down from that, I believe, to four cents. But we thought that was big money back in them days, you know. The times were tough during that time. It was, it was really tough. The wages were low, the price of turpentine was low, of course, mm -hmm. and it's a lot of different to what it is today. And we operated the old steel right on the camp then, you know. We didn't have these uh, plants like we have now. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, just had the turpentine steel. Everything was right on the camp. The steel, everything right, all happened right there. All right, well, this is a painting of an old fire steel done by a friend of ours who gave it to us after it had served her purpose. And this is the old kind of steel that occasionally used to go up in flames so much. Not, not too frequently, but they were, they were hazardous. And it's a far cry from what we have today, which is, which is uh, heated with steam and, and a remote boiler. The kettle itself was made out of hammered copper. And uh, a lot of the trouble would come where the gooseneck for the condenser was attached to the, to the kettle. Isn't that right? And it just would, would separate. You'd, you'd have a gasket leakage or something like that. And when they'd go up, there was just no stopping them. Although fire stills are no longer in use, they played a vital, colorful part in the turpentine story. What's happening here today, Mr. Law? Well, we're running a, a charge of gum on an old-fashioned fire still, which hasn't been done in 30 years or so, as far as I know, and it'll probably be the last time anyone will ever have an opportunity to see this again. Yeah. But this uh, is, is the last still that's operative that I know of anywhere in the United States. Have you ever seen a fire still run before? Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. I have one just exactly like this. When I first came to, to uh, or first got in the naval stores business in 1937, why, practically everyone were, were distilling their gum on a fire still similar mm -hmm. to this. What are the differences in the way this works and the way you distill naval stores today? Well, you start with the crude gum in this process and dump it in the kettle and you use wood for heat and uh, it's all cooked together. And the chips and the dirt are all in the, the cooking process. And the, uh, it was rather difficult to get real clean rosin. And it was really quite a problem for some of the people who use rosin because of the dirt and the trash that was in the rosin. So the process now, you clean all the chips, the dirt, and everything from the gum before it actually gets in the still. It's all filtered and cleaned up so you get a much cleaner, more pure rosin than you did uh, with this process. The Smith still is typical of most fire stills built throughout the southeast. It functions on three basic levels, upper, middle, and lower. Raw gum is delivered to the gum platform on the upper level of the still where it is loaded into a large copper kettle and closed by a brick furnace. The fire does not touch the kettle itself, but heats air in a cavity around the kettle. The gases, which are driven from the gum, pass through a copper coil submerged in a large wooden vat of cool water where they condense into water and turpentine. These flow into a barrel in the spirit room on the middle level where the lighter turpentine rises to the top and is drawn off into a separate container. When all of the turpentine has been cooked out of the gum, the rosin that is left behind is turned out of the kettle into a trough, also on the middle level, 
where it is strained to remove the chips and trash. The filtered rosin is then removed at the lower level in the rear of the still. Here it is tested for quality and put into barrels for shipment. Now this is the principle. In practice, much depends upon the skill and the experience of the stiller. The investment in heavy labor and hardship required to collect the gum can be lost if the still is not run properly. With a full charge of gum loaded into the still and the cap securely in place, the stiller positions himself in the spirit room to monitor the process by both sound and sight. By placing his ear close to the end of the copper coil, the stiller can hear the sound of the gum cooking. A dry, ringing sound tells him that it is time to add water to the gum. A vigorous boiling sound means that the top of the kettle has cooled too much and the fire must be increased to relieve pressure and prevent the highly flammable mixture from boiling over. In addition to listening, the stiller inspects the proportions of turpentine and water coming from the coil. When there is only a thin skin of turpentine left, the stiller knows that the process is complete and that it is time to pull fire and turn out the charge. The cooking process takes from three to four hours. At the Smith still, this allowed time for the old timers to recall how things used to be. Business. Oh, about 40 years. How about you? All my life. All your and I'm 67 years old. Well, I really tell you the truth about it. I was in it uh, in very near all my life, but I was in active uh, uh, manufacturing truck down mm -hmm. there about 40 years. My father and I was in it. I just grew up in it. Mm -hmm. How old were you when you did your first work? Can't well, remember. Can't remember. You all started working when you were young, and then you had a big family, you all had to work start just so as you could. How about you, Mr. Smith? About the same way. Huh? Was your father in the business? No, he was a farmer, but he died when he was when I was small, and we managed to hang on to most of our property. And uh, I liked the woods better than the field. I never, mm -hmm. never liked the farm, and, and uh, I would be out of the woods after the first of January. Mm -hmm. I plan on on not being in the in it anymore. But still, I love the woods, and I don't I don't like the, the, the farm. farm. But I remember when we sold uh, crude gum for three dollars a barrel, three little one dollar bills a barrel. You do too, don't you? I bought a mini barrel of it at four dollars on my platform, delivered. Yeah. I bought a mini barrel of gum on now that. That was the landowner owned the timber and worked the timber. It wasn't a lease job. Yeah. And and he got three dollars. Yeah. What's the least you ever got for a barrel? Of I leave about two dollars and a half. What's it. the most? Hundred and three dollars. That's a, long that's, a long way that's right. When the cooking is finally complete, the rosin left in the kettle is turned out into a trough where three layers of screening filter out the chips and the trash. The bottom screen is covered with cotton batting, and this serves as a fine filter. This batting, or rosin dross as it was called, was collected and sold for further processing. The strained rosin was drawn into barrels for shipment at the lower level of the still. A sample from each barrel was made and graded according to quality. The Department of Agriculture has 13 official grades for rosin. The darker colors are the lowest, and they are called Betsy, Dolly, Edward, Frank, George, Harry, Isaac, Kate, Mary, and Nancy. Legend says they are named for the slave whose skin color they most closely matched. The three highest grades are window glass, water white, and extra. 
Steam distillation at central plants produces more predictable results than the old fire still. But final quality still depends upon the quality of gum from the trees. A cheaper, competitive process for obtaining naval stores has been developed as a byproduct of the wood pulp industry. This tall oil rosin is of a lower quality, but has proved satisfactory for many industrial applications. Change which was once slow is now rapid. Weather, fire, and fluctuating markets have always produced boom or bust, but changes in technology, new southern industries, and the civil rights movement have all had great impact on an industry that depends so heavily on the hard and dirty work of laborers in the woods. Despite these changes, people in turpentine do look to the future. The American Turpentine Farmers Association, founded by the late Judge Harley Langdale of Valdosta, continues to provide a strong voice for the industry. But whatever happens in the future, the heritage of turpentine provides us with a story of proud Southern people black and white, who pass on to us their strengths and their weaknesses, their achievements and their errors. There's just something about being in the woods and being out in the open spaces that's just uh, different from anything else to me. And uh, when I get frustrated or troubled, well, just to get out in the woods and walk around or ride around just seems to calm everything down and get everything back in perspective. I could blow it out. I could blow the blues out on anything, I'm telling you too. I come up in the jip playing the piano. I used to sing your blues so bad you think I'm joke. I used to sing the tune of blues and you know, all that real stuff. I used to sing that. You fight on, you fight on, you fight on, you fight on. Keep your cord in your hand. You fight on, you fight on. 